Hi, welcome to this short tutorial and introduction to Aeolis. This is a brand new game that's currently on Kickstarter, which sits heavily on the civilization, fantasy and miniature um, theme. You can find mechanisms like area majority influence, cooperative mechanism and mainly dice rolling and tile placement. Basically, you're trying to develop the city and the area around Aeolis. So, what's the story behind this great city? On the slopes of the hill, surround the natural port, stands this grand metropolis, what its citizens call the greatest city in the world. But that's what everyone says for their own cities, what makes this city stand out that every visitor really acknowledge the great glory and beauty of this pearl, Aeolis. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to quickly make some introduction. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of the rules. There are various other videos where you can find a how to play video. Maybe you're going to come back and make a how to play video with the final production of the game. For the purposes of this video, we're going to highlight the most important rules, the game flow, the turn sequence, and then we're going to demonstrate a couple of uh, turns so that you get a, a basic understanding and a feel of how the game plays. So Aeolis is a fully co-op game for one to seven players. It is mainly a kingdom building game, which has also strong civilization aspects and lots of detailed uh, miniatures. You can see some of the prototype minis right in front of you and there will be many more unlocked throughout the campaign. So first of all, what you do is you start by selecting a game mode. There are various ways and modes to play the game. You can play a scenario based mode but here we're going to go through a non-scenario uh, session and also what you can do is you can decide the game mode um, difficulty level so you can have an easy mode, a challenging mode, a hardcore mode and a marathon mode each one increasing the difficulty by at least one level so the way these difficulty modes are meant to be played is that each mode has to do with different events that make up um, the flow of the game. In Aeolis you will draw event cards at the start of each round and different modes require you to draw from different event piles, effectively altering the difficulty of the game. Here we're going to set an easy mode which means in round one we have the blessing. You can see the blessing pile in front of you. Then for rounds two and five we're going to draw from age one, curse and blessing. For round 6 we're going to use H1 Invasion and Blessing and for round 7 and 8 we're going to have H1 Curse and Blessing. Obviously if you played a marathon you have more rounds and also you have more events making it more difficult for you. Remember, at the beginning of each round you will draw event card and then you have to know what you have to deal with this round. So another aspect that is important in the game is the selection of heroes. Different scenarios require different heroes. In non-scenario games, you should always have the queen, the merchant, the philosopher, and obviously you're going to face an invasion, so you'll better have an hoplite or a mage to survive. If you're playing solo, select those heroes, but if you're playing a multiple multiplayer game, then you divide the heroes among the players that they are participating. What is really important to note is that each hero has a specific high quality recessed board which is completely different from one another. You can see three of those in front of you right away. Each of those play a different role and the characters, our heroes, need to collaborate in an effective way such that they manage to endure the 10 rounds, at least in the non-scenario mode of the game. Some last notes, we're not gonna go through all the details, but keep in mind that each hero starts with one gold on their player mat, like that. These are the gold coins of the game, except from the merchant who starts with three gold coins or gold tokens and you place them on the respective player mat. Last but not least, the queen starts with one worker, so you place one copper cube in the appropriate location on their player mat and each of the other heroes receives one trained worker, thus the merchant starts with one merchant, the philosopher with one scientist and so on. Keep in mind that they're not uh, we don't have specific units to identify philosophers, scientists, etc. But uh, in any case, we have these denominations of one plus the silver one, which stands for five. So depending when you're, where you're placing them, for example, here the queen, if you place one cube here, 
this indicates that you have a worker there or on the merchant if you have one worker on the top section when you pull it down in the merchant section then this indicates you have a trained worker a merchant again we're not going to go through all the details of um, the game they not this game is not difficult to master and uh, after a couple of turns everything makes sense especially since each player is playing their own hero so they're focusing more on their asymmetric a way of playing and what they need to do to support each other in order to achieve the common goal, survive the 10 rounds uh, era. But before we move to the playthrough to indicate how the game plays and give you some examples, some example turns, let me start by saying that the game is played in 10 rounds. As you can see in the board of the Queen on the bottom of the player map, there are 10 slots and each time a round is progressing, you move the cube from slot 1 all the way down to slot 10 for the last round, indicating the round the players are playing. Also, another important thing is that each round is played in phases. All of the phases are played simultaneously from the players. All the players do their role and do their stuff in each respective phase. Each round has the following four phases. First of all, we have the setup phase. Everyone is working on their own. They collaborate, they discuss, and they do what their character does during their setup phase in parallel. Then all the players move to the player phase where the main actions take place by all of the players. Then we move to the enemy phase. In the enemy phase, the events are resolved. And then we have the conclusion phase where some upkeeping is performed. And this concludes the turn of the game. Very briefly, during the setup phase, buildings produce goods, workers become trained, and scientists produce research. A newly trained scientist immediately produces research, and this is the way this phase of setup goes. The second phase, the player phase, has to do with all the players performing their main actions. Obviously, they coordinate before they do so. The queen will produce workers and build structures. The merchant will buy and sell resources and donate some if needed. The philosopher will try to seize opportunities to establish and understand new technologies, which are very important for the flow of the game. The Oplight will move towards the enemies and try to intercept them to prevent invasions and stop them on the tracks. The priestesses will consume faith and activate one or more abilities during their turn. The Triacontor on the sea will defend the island from sea attacks, pirates and sea enemies in general. And there are a couple of more heroes, but they all in general do their actions during this player phase. During the enemy phase, as we said, the events like natural disasters and un unrest are activated and resolved. Players will know what's coming towards them. Plagues and infernos, fires essentially, attempt to spread and this needs to be checked. The last phase is a conclusion phase. In this phase, all resources are taken from the board, the various structures and buildings, and are allocated to the hero's mats. The players decide who gets what, obviously towards the best interest for the group. Obviously, the queen sets any indifferences and any ties. So, these are the main phases. We're going to see them in practice over the next uh, few rounds to demonstrate how the game plays and give you a brief understanding. Uh, some important things to note is uh, for the movement, the map movement. Except from the Queen and the Merchant, who always are located at the city, and they don't have, for example, here a miniature. Uh, the rest of the heroes have their own miniature, and these are the starting locations. You can see them right away in the center of uh, the table. They are located in the city. And these, they can, these uh, heroes can go out, out of the walls, start intercepting enemies, trying to move across the land and do their task to support the group but again the queen and the merchant are supposed to be located in the city and they never move out then the next thing we need to to make sure we understand is that besides the minis that we have on the board there is a lot of map and territory building the way this works is you can see hexes all over the board with white or light yellow lines so on all these spaces, what is going to happen is every time the queen is going to build structures. Now I'm just putting them randomly. There are rules to this and I'm going to explain them later on. But just to show you that these are going to be occupied by different 
uh, structures, farms, villages, uh, buildings, etc. Even the city on its own is going to be upgraded and the upgraded version of each section will grant additional benefits. We're going to come and see those in detail. But the board is very beautiful and it's going to be populated, upgraded and altered from any game session to the other. And this is very good. The last thing I want to mention is for the sake of clarity and giving better examples, we're going to start by playing the game and we're going to assume that we have sometimes more resources or more trained workers that we couldn't have acquired right away from the first uh, turn of the game, but we're going to imagine that we had them so that we can demonstrate what you can do with them and uh, be more effective in demonstrating what players are doing in the, during their turn and how the game flows. But keep in mind that this has a gradual build up and then you start gathering, collecting resources, collecting technologies, uh, unlocking technologies down the way and so on and so forth. But we're going to have, let's say, cheat and have some more stuff so we can show you more things that you can do during your turn. Okay, so before we start, let me remind you to kindly switch on the Klingon subtitles so that if we need to correct something or add some additional clarifications, we can add them there and you can have a quick look on what makes sense and have the full picture of everything we say here when we describe. So, let's start by playing around. For example, let's say that we're playing one of our rounds and now we're moving with the setup phase. In this phase, what we do is we draw event cards depending on the difficulty level. So we check the round under the player mat of the queen. We check at the bottom of their player mat where the cube is located. So let's say this was, for example, the first round. You can see the cube on the bottom mat of the queen. It's in the slot number one, but it could have been in slot number three indicating that this is round number three, etc. So depending on the difficulty of the game, if we're playing the easy mode during round one, we we'll draw one blessing event card. If this were the rounds two to five, we would draw an H1 curse and a blessing. So let's say it was the first round. As the easy mode indicates, we would draw a blessing card. We would flip it, read it and be prepared for what happens. Basically, it indicates that you move your philosopher or architect, if you have upgraded uh, your philosopher to architect, that is, to the temple hex within the city walls. A slave docks and offers to sell you exotic blood thralls from a land across the sea. That's good. We need blood thralls for one of our heroes. We buy nine, uh, you can buy nine slaves, pay three gold. You can then use them as trained blood trolls or untrained workers. And then there is a bit of flavor text at the bottom, which indicates uh, what goes around this event. So you can read it to get more out of the theme of the game. This is for the first round because the easy mode indicates that we only draw one blessing card. If, we, if this was a subse subsequent um, advanced rule round, like uh, the second, uh, the sixth or whatever, we would draw additional event cards from the respective event decks. For example, if it was the round three, we would draw one H1 curse and one blessing. You can see these are the H1 curses. They have this back. The blue ones have um, and they are age two. And then we have the heroic events. Okay, again, you can see that this indicates exactly what happens. For instance, here, every structure rolls for 30% chance to be infected by a plague. This is a Crimson's Death Plague. This has to do with uh, the plague and would uh, actually jeopardize our structures to be uh, inflected by plague. And this plague would obviously later on uh, spread across. Okay, now another thing to note is that each character comes with uh, their specific card. These are quite handy, big, nice, good looking cards. They have the hero at the back and the location where they are seated. And then they have more details on the back. For example, this is a queen and for each of the phases it indicates exactly what you need to remember and be um, aware so you don't forget. For example, let's start right away. This is uh, the queen. The queen always plays in uh, all of the games. 
unless a new scenario would indicate not so, but I think it would be she would be in most of the scenarios and uh, non-scenario games as well. So during setup, you increase the round counter, we've seen that before, and then what we need to do is we need to produce plus one wood, plus one wheat, and then all structure produce resources and we draw event cards. So, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we've drawn uh, some uh, structures and you uh, see that uh, the map is already occupied. There are quite a few structures already there. Of course, normally this wouldn't hap du happen during uh, round one, but in order to indicate and give some examples, we already have more structures than we would normally have in the early rounds. So, let's go to the player mat of the Queen and see what goes, on, what goes on. Just one sec before we go to the Queen's mat. You can see here we have the bronze and the silver cubes. The bronze cubes are nomination, denominations of 1 and the silver cubes are denominations of 5. Depending on where these are located, they could be different things like resources, trained workers, oplites, uh, EPs, etc. So, going back to the Queen's player mat. Okay, so this key feature character, the Queen, she starts by uh, automatically receiving one wood and one wheat. That means that here, in the wheat recessed session, we will drop one cube and that would indicate that we already have, as a group, plus one wheat. And we would also get one wood, which means we would drop down another cube in this section and uh, thus would indicate that we also have one more wood to spend before proceeding to the production phase of the buildings. Now, it's good that the Queen remembers what she always gets for free, but in case they forget, keep in mind that there is a um, respective uh, player aid for this character, and in the setup phase, it clearly indicates what she needs to remember. Okay. So, we're just in the round one. She would grab some resources, plus one wood and plus one wheat, uh, obviously this would be, let's say, round one or wherever. You can see that she has also additional uh, slots. She has fish, a fish slot and um, a meat slot where different cubes can also be placed for different materials. And then here there are different arrows indicating that you can give one wheat, two wheat actually, to upgrade this and make it a worker. You can give one fish to make a worker out of this, or you can give meat one to one to gain one worker. You just simply follow the arrows. This is important because the queen is the main source of workers, which means she produces uh, untrained workers and she's distributing them to the different uh, characters that uh, we play the game with, like um, the hoplite or the merchant, and they can we can decide as a group and then they can take use of what the Queen gives them in order to make the best out of the round. It's very important to note that we can have as many resources as we want, but when we want to, to upgrade wheat resource to gain workers, we need to spend two instead of one for the fish and uh, the meat. Now, the Queen also is responsible to uh, putting structures down the map, on the map board. Keep in mind that uh, the owner and the keeper of all the pile of uh, structures, which means actually, let me show you, all this big stack of uh, tiles that we already have placed some on the board for simplicity reasons, are kept by the philosopher. And the reason for that is that the philosopher is unlocking potential new buildings to make them available depending on what he studies and what he investigates and what the group knows through to philosophy and later on through uh, with the architect, which is the upgraded version of the philosopher. Now, the philosopher keeps all the pile of uh, all the structures and what he does is he always gives to the queen all the structures that the group can legally build, meaning that we have the requested and required uh, prerequisites or the requested tech investigated or learned so means meaning that we can uh, legally build the structure. What is in the hand of the queen are only the structures that the group has a right to build on the map. So it is an, a nice dynamic uh, duo. You know, the philosopher keeps a hold of all of the tiles, 
and the queen receives from the philosopher only the ones that are at the point of interest at this particular uh, section of the round. Now let's have a quick word on the anatomy of the tiles and what do they have. First of all, they're double-sided. We have in front of us some of the structures already built on the map and on the right you can see the wheat farm. Each tile looks like that at the back of uh, the tile, the actual uh, art. Where you can find the title, which is this is the wheat farm, you can see what you need to spend. You need to spend one worker and one wood. Occasionally you need to spend also stone to build the structure and it will be indicated on the back of, let's say, different tiles. Okay, this one still wants a water, uh, worker and, and uh, a wood, but you would see what are the prerequisites on the back. And at the bottom of the back of the tile, you could see what needs to be already known from the philosopher, from the group. We need to have acquired agriculture, and we, this is where the sieve aspect of the game kicks in, and I really like this. If we have acquired agriculture, then this would be a legal tile for us to build, and we would be able to build it via the queen, because she would already had it as a potential structure to build uh, from the philosopher. Now, before we move back to the queen's player mat, you can see that each builded, um, constructed tile has on, on the top of um, the hex an icon. This is what the location would produce. It also, you can find that this systematically makes sense. The wheat farm, as you can see on the top of uh, the building on the right, has a wheat icon, meaning that during production they would produce a wheat. And more simple than that, what it would mean is that we would roll and if we were successful uh, it would produce uh, one or three or even more. We'll see the production how it works in a, in a bit. Give me a sec. Uh, you can see the different buildings produce different things. For example, you can see the middle building produces both coin and workers. Here. And all of the produced um, materials or workers or whatever resources are placed on the respective hex that produces it. So when this bronze cube is here is a wheat, but if it was uh, somewhere else, uh, where it's a meat farm, it would be a piece of meat or some stuff like that. So you get the idea. Now let's move back to the Queen's player mat. You can see right away that there is a production die on top of uh, the Queen hero mat. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this production die for each of the buildings and we're going to roll them to see what they produce, if they produce something and how many uh, units they produce. So let's move, take the die and move back on the board. Okay, it makes sense that uh, if we are in an advanced round like 7, 8 or 9 or 10, that would have a lot of uh, hexes and a lot of buildings on the map and this section of uh, the game would take a bit more meaning that we will need to check for each tile and its building if they produce by rolling the respective production die. But in the early rounds, this, we wouldn't have so many buildings and it would be easier to uh, go through all the hexes and do see what they produce. So, for example, let's start by, let's say, this building. Okay, This building, we need to check uh, it produces gold because it has a gold icon on the top of uh, the water mill. We roll the die and you see that we get a plague. This is a plague icon. It has a plague doctor mask and the structure is immediately infected by a plague. What you do is you must take a plague token and place it on top of the structure. It does not produce again until the plague is removed. Any unit that moves through the hex receives one damage and in the enemy phase the plague has a 50% chance to spread into adjacent hex with the structure. So in practice what I would do is I would take a plague token place it on that building. This building will not produce this turn and it would be a source of spreading the plague further on. Uh, it will have a chance to spread it in the adjacent structures, but also uh, it, would, it would not produce anything in the future rounds as well if the plague is not removed. We'll see how this goes. Okay, let's roll for this hex here. Again, we got the plague. We'll do the same. We take plague token and we're going to put it on the respective spot. So you can see the plague uh, result is one out of six but okay I'm quite unlucky. This is a plague mask 
icon. So let's go through the rest and I'll be a bit more uh, predetermined to show you what it does. So for example, if we roll this icon, the gold icon, you can see here, that means that this building would produce one gold. So for example, this one, if I roll this icon, would produce one gold and I put uh, one gold on it. Then if I rolled this icon, the one with the three bronze cubes, or this one, the one with the single, I would put the respective amount of these uh, cubes on the production building and see what it produces. So for example, if I rolled, if I was here in this lake and I would roll one cube, I would put one bronze cube there, indicating that this style has produced one fish. Uh, a small correction, when I roll this icon, I don't put a gold coin uh, on the building. Wait a minute, where is it? When I roll the gold coin icon, I'm not placing one of these here. That means that I just give one gold coin to the board uh, on the board of the queen. This is normally gonna get cubes. For example, if I rolled this one, it would get one cube and I would place it here, meaning that this is one unit of gold. Or if I rolled three respectively, I would put uh, three cubes. The same goes if I roll the five, which uh, stands uh, for uh, five units, I would put a silver larger unit on there. And since this icon, uh, this hex uh, has two icons on top of it, it, this means that these uh, units can either be used for workers or for gold. So you get the idea, I'm not gonna roll for the rest. The same happens for all the hexes. You start one building at a time, maybe it's better to start from top and move to the bottom, depending on where you have built the different structures and ensure that the production die is rolled, most probably by the queen, so no mix up would uh, occur and all of the buildings will be uh, rolled and producing or not the respective materials. Just a note, something uh, quite nice is that you don't have different wooden custom markers or gold nuggets or stone uh, meeples or whatever. You just have, I like the system, it's the same like in terraforming Mars, you have small and large cubes and depending where you are placing these cubes on the respective production or structure or building that indicates that you have this type of resource which is the same like the icon sitting on the top of the hex. Quite clever system. Now it's the time for the queen to move to the event decks and depending on the number of the round you and the difficulty level that we have discussed before the queen will draw the respective event or more than one event from the respective decks and read the results and the text and the effects to the rest of the group. Okay, so then we produce structures. We're still with the queen of the Acropolis. So during this uh, player's phase, what happens is the queen uh, will place a structure, a new tile on the, uh, on the hexagonal map board. So as you can see from the top of your player mat, all structures require one worker and one wood. Some structures also could require one stone. Each structure tile has the requirements that you have seen printed on the back. The philosopher will have a stack with all the tiles for the queen and he will have provided the queen in previous rounds with the respective tiles that they are available for construction. In order to place a structure on a hex, the symbols of the top of the structure should match those on the board. If there is a wheat icon on a hex in the board, you can place a structure with a wheat icon on top. That structure would produce wheat. And then all structures have an icon on, on the top clearly to indicate what they would produce. A water mill will produce gold, village will produce that many gold and workers, etc. So if I am the queen and I need to put a new structure from the one that I have already been provided by the philosopher, I would need to spend, for example, here one worker, moving this here, and one wood, and potentially one stone, depending on the back of the tile. I would remove those and then I would take their respective tile and I would place it on the main board. Keep in mind that this must have been provided from the philosopher, meaning that we have as a group discovered copper working, which is the bottom prerequisite, and then this is the cost and then the queen would be able to flip it 
and install it on the board. The production icon is on top and this means that uh, copper will be produced from this mine. This is very useful and very easy to tell what's what. Another thing that the Queen can do down the road in a future round is uh, she can upgrade the Acropolis. By researching monarchy, we need to have this research by the philosopher, the Acropolis may be upgraded. This will mean that the Queen receives one powerful advantage. When attempting to use diplomacy, she would roll a d8 instead of a d4. The Metropolis, the Acropolis sorry, sits in the center of our walled city. You can see, you can see it right here. And this is the requirements for the upgraded version. If we do that, then we would flip it, place it here, and then we would have the upgraded Acropolis. And as mentioned before, during diplomacy, our queen of the Acropolis would roll a d8 instead of d4. What is diplomacy? Obviously, this is a, a specific phase. It makes sense in future rounds when you understand if you can use it to negotiate diplomacy with forces raiding and invading from the north. Uh, the, queen, the queen can decide to roll for diplomacy and uh, she would be able to pay with gold the respective invaders to avoid them moving down and causing more troubles to our beautiful city. Okay, keep in mind that this phase is a simul simultaneous action phase, meaning all players work together, discuss, uh, request things from the Queen, request things from the Philosopher, from Oplite, etc. So we all as a group together decide and make a common strategy depending on the round and the needs uh, in order to defend our city and make a stand till the end of the round uh, 10. So, uh, the next important uh, character that we're going to have uh, some focus uh, on is the Merchant of the Agora. The Merchant of the Agora is a very powerful a hero har character you can see his player board there he controls a lot of things like uh, the materials that we buy and sell you can see that there are a lot of recessed slots with a lot of materials um, and resources for example uh, he can have meat by putting a unit here if you have ever five meat units you can uh, replace it with a silver one so it makes sense you know, to store a lot of cubes on uh, his uh, player mat you can see he has horses, he has fish, wheat, uh, light crystal, void crystal, fire crystal, ice crystal, copper, stone, wood, leather, etc. On the left he has untrained workers and by paying one gold he can move them to the trained section, again a recessed spot, where this indicates he has merchants and he needs merchants uh, to do his work. Another important tool for the merchant First of all, this is a, um, a merchant who manipulates market one. Down the road, he can be upgraded if the respective uh, tower building in the city center is upgraded and his board is going to be replaced by the advanced market two, a board which has access to many more resources. You can see a whole new row on the top, okay? But uh, what I was going to say before, uh, our merchant has another important tool which is this nice um, dial so what he does you can see let's put it like that this indicates some main um, resources you can see in uh, the slots of uh, the top portion of the dial okay the merchant then would roll a d4 would take a d4 roll it and you can see I got one, okay, I'm lucky. <laughs> that means I would uh, move that number of uh, positions clockwise in the dial, let me demonstrate. So from there, I would make this change. So immediately you can see that the units and uh, the ratios below have been modified. The last step is that regardless of how many steps I moved clockwise, depending on my D4 roll, the merchant hero, can decide to either move it plus one or minus one from where the d4 die roll uh, ended the result. So you have quite a few flexibility with this dial and uh, it is very important because, okay, let me, I'm picking it up all the time, but let me show you. You can see that it changes, for example, you need two gold to sell salt or you need to donate wheat to keep your uh, people happy if you want. You have three gold 
a necessity to buy meat or one goal to sell light crystal etc basically what happens is all the ratios are changing both uh, the buy and the sell and the donate so uh, just to keep things clear every round one resource will be offered at a low price of one gold one will be available for two gold and one for three gold and respectively when you sell resources one will be sold for one gold one for two gold and one for three gold last but not least there would be the indication of which uh, resource needs to be donated meaning the people of our city what resource they need to acquire to be happy an important part during our training setup uh, all our during the setup phase during training as we have seen we spent one gold for each cube here to move it there and have trained merchants you see there is a gold icon and the arrow there now what uh, these cubes indicate there this is important because depending on the number of cubes we have uh, as trained merchants that would obviously dictate the number of transactions we can have with a dial so if I had the number of five for example I could sell do two sales to uh, buys and I can do one donation for example because I had five merchants and this is very important uh, because it will help you unlock uh, the trade which is the core of this game donating and morale this can be seen at the bottom of uh, the merchant uh, player mat you can see that our people could be unhappy neutral or they could be plus to happy and this plays a role during battle so uh, donating increase morale and equal to the number of resources you donate meaning this round we've seen that uh, for example what was the dial the donate was set to wheat let's say it was wheat that means that if we donated two wheat keep in mind we need to have respective number of merchants for respective transactions then uh, we would move two slots the morale up towards this um, bottom track Increase morale will be a positive modifier for the army and the navy battles and we need to keep our people happy by providing donations and luxuries when available. Then the last thing that we need to keep in mind is the upgrade of uh, the Agora. Uh, when we research commerce, the Agora may be upgraded. This means that the commerce is one of the things that the philosopher will be able to uh, investigate, to research. The philosopher is on top of the merchant, we'll see him later down the road but if he has research commerce that means that we can also get access to foreign trade so we can also get access to this card and this is very useful because um, the merchant now has all the resources available for trading in addition the merchant may manipulate the market by moving the trade wheel by two position after the initial roll so thus it gives him uh, uh, you know quite a lot of um, flexibility also this is a powerful way to gain a lot of gold you see you give alg pearl and salt and then you acquire 15 gold this is quite uh, handy if you want if you're running low on gold and very useful okay we're still in the players action phase uh, okay we're just explaining the different heroes but this is very important because the player phase is very crucial and it's very different depending on the status of how each character is evolved how many uh, technologies they have investigated, how many trained workers they have, how many resources and material, etc. So uh, it wouldn't make sense to go back and forth for a couple of rounds just uh, showing random things. Just said uh, for the moment we focus on the player boards because they gave crucial information for understanding how the game works. So the philosopher, the philosopher of the academy. During the setup phase, any workers that they are located on the left, similar like the merchant, you pay one gold and they become scientists. Scientists would produce research. You see you have a small recessed spot on the bottom left of uh, the philosopher's mat where research is produced. And this is, let me move the cube so you can see better. This is a cube, a blue, um, a flask with a blue liquid indicating research, resource. And as you can see, there are different rows and we have a diagram with arrows and directional arrows actually from top to bottom and each row on the left has some requirements the first two uh, materials that you can see on top have one a blue flask the second uh, the second row also has one blue flask the third one has two blue flasks so does the fourth and the fifth one has three blue flasks 
but it means that the philosopher can use acquired research to investigate and understand and acquire new technologies. Obviously, you start from the top, moving to the bottom. You cannot acquire a random philosophy or technology if you haven't acquired the previous ones, leading with arrows to this one that you're interested. Only if an event gives you a free technology, and in that case, you would place a disk here to acquire this technology. But in order to get the next one, you cannot move going from uh, this branch working, for example, to Warcraft uh, until you have researched the previous one, if it wasn't researched like that. Uh, so you make, uh, you close the link essentially. What is very important is that uh, obviously, as the arrows depict, in order to have some technologies, you need to also have the ones before them. So you need to methodically make uh, your way in order to be able to acquire the more advanced one at the bottom like navigation, education, warcraft, commerce, monarchy. We've seen monarchy, we need it for upgrading of our acropolis and um, the occult, etc. These are very important technologies and we need them. But also keep in mind, this is done during the player phase. The philosopher can discover as many technologies as he can afford by spending resources, uh, cubes, which actually are the um, research cubes that we've seen on the top, on the bottom left. But what it's important is that depending on what the philosopher discovers, and here's the nice part of the game and I really like, more buildings become unlocked because you have met the prerequisites, meaning the bottom. Let me show you again, want to remind you. The bottom prerequisite of uh, the tile. Here he is copper working in order to have copper mines. So that means that the philosopher would also give this uh, building structure to the queen so the queen doesn't have to keep an enormous huge pile of uh, tiles in front of her only the ones that she can legitimate build uh, because they have the technologies and the prerequisites that the buildings indicate very clever system an important thing to note is that you can upgrade your uh, academy the building within uh, the city walls by researching education the academy may be upgraded and when this happens you add the architect hero mat to that of the philosopher and immediately replace the philosopher miniature with the architect on the same hex. You can see the architect has additional uh, arrows, additional material and additional um, um, things to be discovered and technologies to be discovered. Very clever tech tree, I really like it. Obviously the cost is much higher now, you can see that the need is much more because you're moving towards uh, chivalry, human rights, colonization, etc. So you're moving in theory down the road of uh, the timeline. So you're investigating and acquiring much more modern uh, technologies, let's say, and principles. Just quickly to note some of the focused uh, technologies that uh, really unlock the game flow. Uh, when you discover horse breeding, players can also produce horses. Uh, and then they're able to discover and take the, uh, the EP's, uh, the EP's uh, hero mat, meaning that instead of the Oplites, they also have an additional army unit and they unlock it. Uh, with the witchcraft, they can eliminate the backlash of spells. Once discovered, that means there could not be a chance of miscasting an, uh, a spell and having the negative effects. Additionally, you can have a fletching where the arena, this would allow the arena to build a uh, Toxote units, meaning archers. As soon as fletching is discovered, you offer the Toxote hero mat to the person who controls the army units. So he has an additional player mat with the archers and the additional respective miniature to go with it on the map. And you get the idea. So lots of technologies not only unlock prerequisites for buildings, but also unlock, in example, for the army units, additional mats and additional miniatures that are controlled by the person who controls the Oplites. Speaking of the Oplight uh, of the arena, you can see the player mat character in front of you on the top of the screen. Uh, obviously, again, during the previous phase, the setup phase, any workers assigned for training now become Oplights, as long as one gold per worker uh, training cost is paid. You can see the slots, the, slots, the recessed slots, uh, the untrained workers here, if you had one, say, there, uh, with one gold, or even more, if you had more gold, they would be upgraded to Oplites and moving to the top slot there, indicating you have more army 
units. So, what they can do, the Oplites of the Arena, the character, can also create bronze. Once a philosopher discovers bronze working, you can pay one gold in order to transmute one, go one copper into bronze. You can use this bronze for unlocking weapons, upgrades, or spend it in the blessing events if that event requires it. So, during the player phase, again, you can unlock different upgrades. You can see, I'm not going to go into details. You can see with the respective requirements. You can easily follow the arrows. There is a cost. And then, for example, you can uh, unlock the different upgrades and you can put the green slot discs on the top, indicating that you have upgraded weapons, meaning you have more efficiency in battle. Another important thing to note is that, as we mentioned before, if the philosopher has discovered uh, fletching, then you would be able to, the player controlling the Oplite of the arena would also get this board controlling the Toxote, which is uh, the archers. They also have their own sections with different untrained workers to be uh, upgraded to Toxote. And then you can also have upgraded uh, weapons on top and putting the respective uh, green discs there. And effectively, if the philosopher again discovers the um, horse breeding, then you get the piece, which are the cavalry in Greek, and you can see they also come with their own player mat and their own, uh, actually, they also come with their own miniature. That is, this is for the e piece and this is for the toxote, uh, the archers, that they also go on the main board. Keep in mind that it's uh, best that the player who controls the first oplight of the arena a unit also gets uh, the rest, or if you're playing with. Uh, say for example more players, I don't know if you want to divide them between you, but it would make sense for one person to focus on the army units uh, on his own. A last thing to, to note is that this person has actual both player mats and physical miniatures on the board because they're going to move and they're going to protect the units, they're going to try to stop invading armies, raids, etc. The next thing that also happens during the player phase is the combat. When a unit enters a hex occupied by an enemy, combat begins. After the combat is resolved, there will be only one type of unit in the hex, either the enemy or, your, uh, or yourself if you have managed to be victorious. An important thing to note is uh, on each of these uh, player character mats you can see uh, a number next to the speed. You can see, for example, that EPs have a speed of uh, 4, meaning that their miniature can move up to 4 hexes on the main board. Uh, obviously, someone not uh, being carried by a horse has a lower speed, like for example, okay, the queen stays within the city walls, so does the merchant, but the philosopher has a speed of three. Uh, sorry, a speed of two, meaning he's more slow. And his miniature, who is at the bottom, would only uh, move uh, from uh, his location to two subsequent adjacent uh, hexes, making a path. Next character of our group, of our team, is the Priestess of the Temple. She starts with uh, four slots, with four die. Uh, they all start on the level of one. Okay, this now they indicate different numbers, but they start with one. So, she has also uh, workers untrained that she can either uh, make priestesses by paying one gold, or if the morale moves down, they can become blood throw and being able to be sacrificed as a requirement. We'll see down the road. So, this is the mini of um, the Priestess of the Balance. Lots of minis are displayed on the, this prototype, but keep in mind that uh, there are many more to be, to be had in the game, and this will be followed from the Kickstarter campaign. Keep an eye on the campaign to have a look on what they have with the minis. Lots of minis are to be included. So, again, like uh, with all of uh, the characters, the Priestess of, uh, Priestess of the Balance has her own card. You can see it here. So she has a different uh, setup phase where the workers become priestesses or blood thrall. And um, the phase then is increased by one on every die. What it happens is uh, her dice indicate the faith in different uh, sections of the faith and they can be used to keep uh, you know, affecting different uh, phases of the game. For example, you have the confine which stops the plague spreading. Uh, depending on the number of uh, on the die, you can reduce it. And what happens is, remember before we had um, a hex a structure, we had the plague icon. You put a bronze cube on it, indicating that it will not spread from this uh, building to the next in the subsequent um, round, as uh, the game denotes. 
Uh, also, you can have a bless. Uh, army units can reroll combat die, and then you, you know, you take down the die, and then uh, you use faith to bless your uh, army units. You have to be within the same hex like the army unit in order to bless it. You can, uh, you can have a augury for blessings or curses, and you can have proselytize for diplomacy plus one, meaning that you would give a bonus to your queen when she's rolling for diplomacy, like we have seen before. These are very powerful boosts, and it's very uh, clever for the players to use her abilities, the abilities of the Priestess of the Balance, in order to uh, help the group. Keep in mind that uh, when her respective building is upgraded, meaning that when the temple is upgraded, then she would be upgraded to this player board. Again, putting the four dice on, on there, like before. And um, her powerful abilities are even more useful. For example, she can cure also plagues. You can see here, you put the same die on this slot. Not only she stops the plague, but uh, she can remove the plague icon from uh, the building, and thus the building would be able to produce again in future rounds. Very, very useful. And the same goes for the rest of the slots. I'm not going to go into details. She does all the previous uh, aspects of the faith uh, much better and with much more efficiency. She's more powerful, and that's why she's more uh, useful to the group. Next character in our group is the Meiji of uh, the Oracle. It's this miniature here, you can see her. Um, this is a very powerful character. She's using magic, she has these balls with crystals and she's using uh, crystals to perform specific uh, spells. She comes with her own deck, which I'm showing here. And as you can see, each spell has, uh, you know, a positive result. So, you know, they, they can kill enemy combat uh, units, they can uh, cancel the event flood, etc. You need to spend the amount of this color crystals, so one purple, one blue, two red, etc. depending on the spell you're casting. You draw more spells each time and especially um, they're especially powerful and very useful and can get you out of a very negative uh, situation. But you need to keep in mind the, you know, the backlash of the spell. So you roll a die to see if you get any uh, backfire from the spell. This is from, from this hero. For example, if this pack fires, you lose one merchant, etc. Like all the heroes, if she has untrained workers during setup, these are upgraded with one gold to become Meiji. And uh, the way she works, I'm not going to go into more details. This is not the point of this video. Uh, sh this is the starting uh, sphere. You can have a lot of crystals here, but as you move crystals, and you keep moving crystals down the different bowls to reach the more powerful ones at the end, as you're doing that, actually you start from the, this one and then you make all the movements and go back to the black sphere. As you do that, you're trying to get a lot of uh, different, same color uh, crystals within a different ball. You cannot have, for example, green, um, yellow and blue in this one. They need to be only blue ones and uh, you need to have the specific amount you require. You need actually, as we've seen before, to perform uh, the various uh, powerful spells. What is important to note that again, with the respective upgrade within the city, this character can be upgraded to the Scorpio. Uh, this is a Serpent Meiji and it can be upgraded to the Scorpio Meiji here with uh, her different um, board, more plates, more abilities. You see there are a lot of um, crystals, so you can do a lot of things with uh, the crystal flow and a lot of uh, powerful spells can be casted. And she comes with her own deck with more powerful spells uh, to be to be acquired and used during uh, this character's phase. So she is the more upgraded one and you get here when you upgrade the respective building in the city. Okay, the last character is the Triaconder of the Harbor. They start within the city at the docks. You have this nice uh, miniature. Looks very cool. You get more with uh, the game. This is just the prototype components. Looks very cool. Okay. So, again, during the setup phase, this guy would, uh, if he had any workers for one gold and one good, they would become captains. And you need captains to keep fighting uh, naval combats, also to make explorations to discover new things. You see this pouch, you have this pouch with uh, things to be explored, and there are things like those that I have thrown and placed in each of the sections of the compass. 
southeast, southwest, south, uh, northwest, and northeast, and you put one in any of those. Uh, what you can do is you can send explorers to try to get a uh, loot back uh, to your city. For example, this will give you 10 research points, quite a lot, uh, and you have a, a percentage, 66, uh, sorry, 99 percentage uh, chance uh, to hit it. So you need to, to, to have more. You can make the chance roll even higher by putting, you know, spending, um, upgrading captains and uh, having 10% plus uh, for each of your uh, die roll. And I'm saying die roll because you're rolling this percentage die to indicate if you have a success or not. Again, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, this is how the exploration works to grant a lot of benefits and loot. Very nice, neat system. But also keep in mind that uh, this miniature is on the board. We have a lot of sea hexes that uh, different uh, events would uh, produce uh, pirates, Minon you know, pirates attacking us and we need uh, to go out in the seas and defend them. And by having captains, we'll be able to commence uh, naval battles. And this unit is also very important. Again, they have their own speed and different stats indicated here. By upgrading the docks, the harbor, then you receive this upgraded uh, version, which is nothing less than the upgraded uh, trireme. So by researching navigation, the harbor would be upgraded and this would mean that all the naval units will be instantly upgraded. They no longer roll a D4 in combat like before, but they roll a D8 instead. All triaconders are replaced by triremes and they're more powerful. You can see they have more slots for loot and uh, they're all a better die for the naval combats. Just a quick word about army naval uh, combat. Uh, basically, when this happens, we're going to have different raids uh, coming from the north, trying to invade and, uh, you know, corrupt our city and loot our city and create problems. This is where our army units, Oplites, Epis and Toxote come in place. We also could have wars and uh, not just uh, raids that uh, they again invade and trying to make a mess out of our city. We can have uh, sea naval combats like Minoan pirates, etc. All these things would come from events and it could be very easy for uh, invaders to try to come at our city. So we switch from civilization and tech and uh, development and tile placement and city building and area building game into a tower defense kind of game, which is quite nice. So the combat is very simple. For example, let's say our players want to defend against uh, the, uh, the Cademan um, Spearmen. The players would uh, roll, for example, their power. So they would roll a d4. Then you would add the number of players that are uh, in participating in the battle from the respective Oplites uh, board, meaning how many of those are uh, participating in the battle. Keep in mind that uh, the miniature needs to be uh, on the respective, let's say this was the raid section for uh, the battle to commence. Unless uh, we have archers which can, uh, or the army uh, of, or, or the war uh, token has, uh, is considered to have to um, Toxote as well, archers, so they can attack from adjacent uh, tiles as well. These are details, I'm not going to go into the details at the moment. So what you do is you would add the d4 of the number of the Oplites, plus the number of Oplites participating in the battle, plus the morale bonus. And this is why the morale of uh, from the merchant is important, because he can, uh, for example, if it's here, you can make minus two to you in the final result, and that could be devastating and cause you to lose uh, the raid. So, if you win the combat, then you destroy all the enemy units. However, you also suffer one damage from the fight. You must remove one of your participating Oplites. Therefore, you won the battle, but now you have only two. Uh, one, I would say, Oplite if I had, uh, for example, here two in my board. And there's a case of losing the combat. If you lose the combat, then all of your units are destroyed. However, the enemy units are also damaged. You place one copper cube under the miniature of uh, the invading um, uh, army or the invading uh, raid to indicate that they suffered one wound and in subsequent attempts and subsequent battles they would also have a minus one so if they had a plus five they would have uh, due to the bronze cube at the bottom of the mini base they would have four 
and again uh, that would make sense. Now keep in mind that in some cases some um, specific amount type of um, armies have advantages against others in raids. So for example Oplites had an advantage against a horse riding unit uh, so their cubes would count as twice if they were attacking a horse riding units. The Toxote have advantage against any foot soldiers and the APs have advantage against any archer units. When we have a war, you, have, you are considered to have a mixture of all of those, so no advantage is uh, accounted for. Again, you can have to keep an eye on uh, upgrades because upgraded uh, weapons would grant you better successes and better results in fighting. So, there you have it, a word about war. It's very simple and very straightforward. But you need to keep an eye on what's going on. A lot of invasions will start rolling down, uh, especially the north or the sea, uh, via the events coming in play. So you need to keep everything under control. Uh, also, the events are different events. They can introduce the plague, which spreads from one building after uh, at the other. You, you make a die roll to see how they spread. You can have arrest. You can have plunder or raids. All the events would uh, have difficult thing coming against our players so we need to be careful to uh, be able to be in a position to tackle them efficiently. So there you have it. This is Eolis, a brand new game on Kickstarter. Uh, I didn't play a couple of rounds, I just wanted to show you the main concept of the game. I think it would be more confusing of showing just a couple of rounds without explaining exactly what the character does. It's more easy now for, for everyone to understand what is the purpose. It's a game with no difficult rules, actually they're quite simple rules, but the beauty comes from the combination of the different role each player has depending on the character they control. It's very important for the Queen to provide their um, different heroes with workers because they're not going to have you know, the fuel to, to, to put it in their engine and start producing what they do. It's important to keep an eye on raids and wars, you need the army to defend yourself. Research from the philosopher is so important. You need to be able to monitor very closely what you acquire or what prerequisites you investigate and what technologies you get because that would dictate what buildings you can effectively access to and give to your queen for her to build. Uh, the priestesses are very powerful uh, heroes because they give uh, boosts from different uh, portions of the game. The same goes for the magi because they have a lot of powerful spells from their deck. The, the naval uh, track on their hero player also very important because they would defend again via sea from the invasions and the pirates and also they can collect additional things by exploration and gain wealth, research, gold, etc. Lots of things to keep an eye in this game. I really like what they have done. This is just a prototype and it looks gorgeous uh, to begin with. Uh, I'm very impressed about uh, the art. It makes sense. It's nice how the game is being populated hex by hex and tile by tile, providing a different layout every time. It looks very nice. I like how you have the focus within your city and each upgrade within your city buildings uh, has a crucial role to how your uh, character performs or he's potentially upgraded to a better one uh, down the road. Very carefully crafted this game, has a lot of things going on. Uh, maybe you need a couple of rounds to get uh, quite under the idea. Maybe it's better to start by the easy mode I would suggest, but it's very important that each person understands their role and their specific um, plus and minuses, their advantages and disadvantages and how they need to monitor every aspect of uh, uh, what they perform and what they do in the game in order to be able to contribute to you know, uh, making a stand for uh, lasting 10 rounds from the invasion essentially and all the natural disasters that are coming down the road. Great game, lots of uh, nice aesthetic points here, lots of cool ideas. I like the asymmetry of the characters, I like how differently it feels if you play the Philosopher or if you play the Applied or if you play the Queen, very different uh, feeling. So this gives a lot of fair playability in my opinion, depending on what side you're playing. You need to really collaborate very efficiently. It's a co-op game, but it's a co-op game where collaborating really matters. It can hurt you if you don't do it uh, carefully. Uh, so you need to carefully plan as a group and execute accordingly. I haven't seen collaboration games, co-op games in uh, civilization games, and this is a new, a fresh idea. Very cool aspects in this game, I highly recommend it. Hope you got a real good understanding about how the game works. I'm going to put the link to the Kickstarter uh, campaign in the description. If you like what you have seen, go and support and fund this project to make Aeolis uh, 
you know, a success and fund it on Kickstarter. Many thanks for watching.